Company of Prophets, African American Psychics, Healers, and Visionaries, written by Joyce Elaine Knoll, read by Ausid O'Neill, produced by Company of Prophets. Chapter One Continued, Children of Power. It was a regular thing that most of us kids would walk home to lunch, and there was always a train, boxcars, standing on the tracks near the school. We'd crawl under it or over it to get to our houses for lunch, remembers Callistine Williams of being a fifth grader. On this particular day, I was puzzled at strong feelings that the train meant danger. I warned everybody I could not to go near. Some of us did not go home at all for lunch. The feeling was so strong. Some of the kids were not convinced, though. The train began to move, and one boy was cut in two. Without self-doubt, Callistine acted on these intuitive messages of danger. Another incident involved a bridge, which she and the rest of the neighborhood children either crossed or played on every day. It spanned a deep ditch where the water level would get high enough for someone to drown. One morning, she mentions, a feeling began to bother me that there was danger. I went to the store in the neighborhood and got some white wrapping paper and penciled in, Don't play on the bridge. I posted the sign. That evening, the bridge collapsed. No one was on it, but there was some dogs on it and they ended up in the water. Forming within Calistine when she was but six was a sensitivity about people and houses. Emanating from people, she perceived an energy which clearly told her of their emotions and attitudes. Of houses and geographical areas, she could sense whether they would be good places in which to live. At ten, Hysterical, she told her mother and stepfather everything she felt about the house they planned to buy. It would not be a good home or good investment, she advised. But they didn't listen. The house became a place of terrible family conflict once they moved in. Its function for the family unit was finally destroyed when Callistine's stepfather declared himself sole owner of it and evicted the rest of the family. Mostly burdened by her gift while growing up, the Mississippi-born psychic, who now lives in Memphis, Tennessee, says in those early years she played the comedian to mask that she felt different. The girl's mother, perplexed by her young child's unusual perception, often questioned the validity of what was sensed. But from her grandmother... Callistine received the strong, reassuring message, God is speaking to us through you. Hurt by a blow to his head in a schoolyard accident, six-year-old Ron was transformed. Thereafter, he was subjected to small epileptic seizures. At first, the attacks came daily, but their frequency lessened as he grew into his teens. Affected, He went inward, became meditative, and a loner, as he describes it. But flung open was the door to a new world. Scenes unfolded to him as if he were watching television. At thirteen, in a vision, he saw the house he and his wife presently own. Initially, most of his visions were about himself, but gradually he began to see future information about family members. Almost immediately following the accident, his dreams changed. To the six-year-old, some of the contents of his new dreams were very strange. However, in time, many proved prophetic. Visible to him when he looked at the sky were Indian chiefs, riding across its expanse. Their presence was somehow very reassuring to the boy. At the phase of the full moon, while he watched the sky he saw images of the future. Later in his life, he experienced these predictions as they were manifested. A prime target for bullies, Ron avoided them with his sensitivity. 
Through his body came a signal when a bully or other danger was near. His hair stood up on the back of his neck. There was further acceleration of his awareness after he again was knocked unconscious in an accident at age 12. He started experimenting with telepathy. He sent out thoughts of love and harmony. His parents became discordant with one another. Wanting to keep the family together, he directed strong thoughts of love and reconciliation toward them. The relationship between his parents improved, as did their home life. Ron was 14 when he saw a Wolfman movie with a tarot card reader in it. I felt I was shown about the cards because they were a deep well to relate from, he asserts. Shortly after seeing the movie, he joined a metaphysical book club and secured books on the tarot. In libraries and bookstores, he determined what he should read by running his hands along the shelves of books until he felt heat on his hands. The heat-generating book was selected. With his mother, Ron shared freely his precognitions, and she told of some of her own psychic experiences. However, the child never told anyone when he foresaw death. He felt intuitively that it was not the right thing to do. At school, he learned from experience that if he spoke of his visions there, he would be taken to the nurse's office. In a reading, Ron was told he was an advanced and able psychic being, an adept in a past life. But at that time, he had been overpowered by magicians of evil intent. Using his gifts, Ron relates how he found Sandra, his second wife and soulmate, who early in her life became aware of her spiritual self. Together they are raising their child and Sandra's child from a previous marriage to know themselves as spiritual beings. Both children are gifted. A resident of Los Angeles, Ron Bonner, uses tarot cards to give consultations. He emphasizes in his teachings how people can change their lives and that obstacles can be overcome by the human will. When I was little, I used to get death all the time. I asked God to take that gift from me. I never wanted to be a medium this lifetime. I never wanted to claim that kind of energy. But that is the kind of energy that I initially drew. When I would be on the Greyhound bus going to visit my father, especially on the turnpike, I would see people where there had been accidents. I'd see them walking and searching and looking. It was heavy. I realized after a while they weren't real. No one could see them except me. Delilah Grayer's first awareness of her abilities came when she was around five years old. Until adulthood, she says, her powers were not productively used. Encouraged to talk freely about her spiritual perceptions and prophetic dreams, the child enjoyed a secure home life. As the seventh female child in her family line to be psychic, she felt most harmoniously situated. Though she protested over her perception of death and her view of afterlife states being the dominating quality in the emergence of her abilities, Delilah reminds us there was also a lighter side. I had a dream that my mother surprised me at Christmas with a suit I really wanted. She didn't put it under the tree until later on Christmas Day, and that happened in reality. In the dream, I wore the suit to school, and a string was hanging down. I pulled the string, and the suit fell apart. I totally forgot about the dream and wore the outfit to school. I was sitting in English class. I'll never forget it. I pulled the thread, and the suit fell apart. I screamed, oh, God, just like in the dream. With her gifted daughter, Bakara Oni, Delilah Grayer now lives in Shaker Heights, Ohio. The mother and grandmother of Bakara Oni Lewis sat in numbed silence. They had just learned that the child's great-aunt Gladys 
had been rushed to the hospital and was in the intensive care unit. Neither adult really noticed the little girl entering the room, but soon both were blown from solitude by the authority in the child's voice. That lady is so tired. She is so tired. Taken aback, the child's mother Delilah asked, What lady? Bakara Oni said she meant the lady in the hospital. She told her mother that they were cutting a hole in the lady, right here, and the little girl pointed to her throat. Mommy, she breathes like this. The two-year-old then did an imitation of a shrill-pitched, labored breathing. Lying down on the floor, she built to shriller tones and then became softer and less audible. Despite Delilah Grayer's abundant personal and professional familiarity with psychic phenomena, she could not control the panic she felt in watching her own daughter. As Delilah considered giving in to an impulse to leave the room, Bakara only commanded, Mommy, stand still. Don't move. Listen to me. The child began singing a nursery rhyme, a favorite of Aunt Gladys. She stopped singing suddenly and said, Don't you see her flying up to the sky? The family learned that their relative died at approximately the time that Bakara only dramatized her ordeal, and that as part of the emergency treatment the woman had undergone a tracheotomy. In early childhood, Bakara's talent was evident, to view into and be inside spaces at a distance from her body. Her mother recalls one example of many a time when they passed a house which her child remarked she had been in before and that she knew what the house looked like. She described a room with a lot of people sitting around a table drinking and playing cards. None of this was apparent from the closed-up exterior. However, on their way back home, Delilah saw the exact scene described by Bakara through a door which had been opened. During the same period before her sixth birthday, Bakara Oni had clear memory of a brief past life, the details of which she shared unaltered with her mother many times. She named her brothers and sisters then and described her toys. There had been a tragedy, a fire. Since infancy, Bakara Oni has often been a calming influence on her mother during stressful times while in the child's presence, the parent feels her worries diminishing. Delilah perceives her daughter, now in middle childhood, as being less free. There are reduced instances of astral travel and diminishing evidence of the spontaneous side of her gifts. But her ability to predict remains unchanged. She often informs of events. There has been a trade, a surrendering of some psychic spontaneity and drama for deeper insights of a spiritual nature. The woods behind Augusta's house was inhabited by a number of beings not of the physical world, beings only visible to the child. She discovered Indians seemingly in another dimension whom she loved to watch as they gathered and cooked herbs. They showed no concern in the least at the five-year-old's encroachment on their camp. Soon, admitted among them, the child was taught to hunt herbs and prepare remedies to be used in healing. Augusta retained this information on herbs, and when she was a healer at 18, she used it. Beings she later recognized as angels spent hours singing and playing with her. The devas gave her a present of two Chinese dolls in a swing, and the dolls delighted her, although they were only spirit world manifestations. On Christmas of that year, she was especially surprised by the gifts from her parents, the identical toys in real-world substance. After she told her mother of the Indians, the angels, and the dolls, Augusta was shut off from the woods and strictly forbidden to go there again. The final sundering of Augusta from her woods in Slaughter, Mississippi, came when her family moved to Stuttgart, Arkansas, before she was six. 
Her companionship with beings of other dimensions ceased until she was twelve. At that age, more beings from the etheric world came to counsel her, and the way she was gifted became more defined. Among the extra physical ways she perceived were by visions, prophetic dreams, and telepathy. At eighteen, she began her spiritual work by preaching and using her gifts of healing and prophesying in her life's mission, that of helping people improve their lives. Born in Mississippi, Bishop Augusta Harris now lives in Little Rock, Arkansas, where she is a spiritual counselor and the founding pastor of Damascus Spiritual Church. I do not know when the visions began. Certainly I was not more than seven years old, but I remember the first coming very distinctly, recalled Zora Neale Hurston in her autobiography, Dust Tracks on a Road. My brother Joel and I had made a hen take an egg back and been caught as we turned the hen loose. We knew we were in for it and decided to scatter until things cooled off a bit. There was some cool shade on the porch, so I sat down, and soon I was asleep in a strange way. Like clear-cut stereopticon slides, I saw twelve scenes flash before me, each one held until I had seen it well in every detail and then been replaced by another. There was no continuity as in an average dream, just disconnected scene after scene with blank spaces in between. I knew that they were all true, a preview of things to come, and my soul writhed in agony and shrunk away. But I knew that there was no shrinking. These things had to be. I did not wake up when the last one flickered and vanished. I merely sat up. Arising from the strange sleep, Zora was sobered. The carefree child of a short time ago was gone forever. I was weighed down with a power I did not want. I had knowledge before its time. I knew my fate. I knew that I would be an orphan and homeless. I knew that while I was still helpless, that the comforting circle of my family would be broken and that I would have to wander cold and friendless until I had served my time. The visions returned at random periods to haunt her at night. They were unaltered in detail except for the last picture. Zora never told anyone about the revelation, fearing she would be laughed at and thought of as different. Born in Eatonville, Florida in 1901, Zora was nine years old when her first vision came to pass. At that time, she, as one of the family's eight children, was orphaned by her mother's death. Oh, how I cried out to be just as everybody else. But the voice said, no, I must go where I was sent. The weight of the commandment laid heavy and made me moody at times. I studied people all around me searching for someone to fend it off, but I was told inside myself that there was no one. It gave me a feeling of terrible aloneness. I stood in a world of vanished communion with my kind, which is worse than if it had never been. Time was to prove the truth of my visions, for one by one they came to pass. As soon as one was fulfilled, it ceased to come. William Edmondson had his first vision at thirteen or fourteen years old while working in the cornfields. This he described to his biographer, Edmund L. Fuller, for the book, Visions in Stone. I saw in the East World. I saw in the West World. I saw the flood. I never read no books nor no Bible, and I saw the water come. It come over the rocks, covered up the rocks, and went over the mountains. God, he just showed me how. Born in Nashville, Tennessee, about 1883, William Edmondson was more than 50 years old when he began to sculpt in stone. His art is in the collections of museums and art galleries around the country. Starting with a full moon phase, six-year-old June Juliet Gatlin slept 
continuously three or four days. Her worried parents, in an effort to break the sleep, forced her eyes open, but everything she saw in this state was in double image, and when she was stood up, her legs collapsed under her. Undisturbed by the body's afflictions, June, the spiritual being, viewed the scene from a distance. From the ceiling, she looked down at her body, aware of her external volition without it. While in the hospital, with her physical self undergoing brain scans and series of tests, June willed herself spiritually about in astral travel. Even before she was three, she knew she lived in two worlds, of spirit and of flesh. By six years old, spiritual activity was increasing and would continue intensifying through her 14th year. During one hospitalization, a staff doctor following the case remarked to June's parents that her state was well known in his native West Indies, where children with similar trance-like symptoms were called moon children. Spirit intelligences whom she calls energies came to teach her early this lifetime, guiding her to experiences needed to expedite her evolvement in an existence as a being. Wandering through the aisles of libraries, she was guided to books crucial to her spiritual enfoldment, which she identified by intuitive touch. Past lives opened up, especially those spent in India. Untrained in India's religious practices, she spontaneously at 13 assumed advanced meditative yoga positions. Later, when led to books on yoga, the familiarity of the knowledge she attained in those lives long ago was integrated knowingly into her present life. One of nine children, June was born in Akron, Ohio, to devoted parents who provided their children with a comfortable and economically secure life. With her peers, she was a confident and natural leader, a nonconformist who believed in challenging authority and in testing the validity of rules at school and at church. June was born with the gifts of prophecy and healing. Her childhood church, Church of God in Christ, co-founded by her grandfather, was the place where these early talents were affirmed. Members of the congregation, aware of June's healing presence, would crowd around her, seeking help. Unfamiliar with ways to handle the denseness of negative psychic energy generated by crowds, June unknowingly absorbed that energy and fainted. Her parents then took measures to protect their daughter from detrimental public exposure. Church members would line up to touch her and speak with her. They would testify to the physical, emotional, and spiritual benefits they received through June's contact with them. By age nine, June discloses she was already aware of her responsibilities and purpose for this life, to assist other African Americans in knowing spiritually who they are. She explains that African Americans have limited themselves by allowing others to dictate to them instead of following their own directions and using their own resources. I am here, she declares, to awaken black people, to shock them out of inertia, out of accepting and not questioning. The African-American community in the small South Carolina town in the late 20s and early 30s had, for all intents and purposes, put the child up for trial, convinced she was a witch. Her presence and behavior instilled fear and hostility in many Bennettsville residents, as they did in her stepsisters and stepbrothers. The community's trial was called off when she triumphantly marched about with the Bible and a cross, both of which the residents finally agreed no witch would dare to carry. To reduce her otherworldly awareness, when she was five, Estelle's parents took her to a root doctor. The treatment failed to work. She continued boldly and assertively to foretell and to experience in ways that confounded those about her. However, having psychic awareness himself, Estelle's father understood his daughter, though he was unable to protect her from his wife's severe beatings and the community's ridicule. Still, he encouraged her to use her gifts saying she had a mission from God. 
Seeing death upon her only ally, timorously Estelle queried him, Daddy, are you going to die and come back to scare me? Three weeks after assuring his twelve-year-old that he had no such intentions, her father died. The girl's stepmother, who had overheard their talk, predictably blamed the child for his death. Like many children touched by wonderment, she innocently shared with others what she felt and saw, the sensation of being in the body of a bird she had seen perched in a tree, seeing the world through its eyes, the trees talking to her, angels singing. Sometimes she would leave her body to travel, cutting loose from feeling unwanted. At the opening of church services, she knew already which ones among the congregation would be saved that day. Especially at night, Estelle would see ghosts wandering around the countryside. Some would approach to attack her, but she called out to God, and like puffs of smoke, malevolent spirits vanished. Barely seeing over the countertop in the toy store, not knowing the name of what he wanted, five-year-old Chuck Wagner pointed instead to the item almost hidden away on the highest shelf. The tarot cards handed to him were, on a physical level, totally unfamiliar to the boy, but instinctively he had been attracted to them, and he knew at once how to use them. While his childhood cohorts were playing with their trucks and mimicking a current hero Hopalong Cassidy, Chuck was busy with the cards. To discourage his card playing, Chuck's maternal grandmother, who raised him, took his tarot deck away and burned it. A highly religious, strict fundamentalist, she saw the cards as instruments of the devil. Chuck's mother, who was very young when he was born, wanted to be a singer. She and her sisters were persistent in their attempts to get away from home and the South. They would sometimes jump boxcars in their eagerness to escape. When only five years old, Chuck, her only child, tried to persuade her not to go on one of these trips. I told my mother if she waited, her dreams would come true, Chuck recalls. I think everybody thought she would have a bad time and wouldn't do well, and maybe she'd have to hitchhike home. After she had gone, he was still puzzled by the message from the cards. I kept telling my grandmother that she would come back in a box. I didn't know she would come back dead in a coffin. After her daughter's death, Chuck's grandmother stopped objecting to his tarot card readings. She had grown certain of his gift being God-given. When he spread the cards, Chuck felt he was watching a movie. They came to life for him, conveying meaning he passed on to others. He was saying things he could not have been told previously. No one had previewed the information or requested it. Although certain of what the cards revealed to him, the child did not know what he was doing. It seemed a game and unreal. At times, he thought people agreed with him and validated his pronouncements because they liked his grandmother and wished to keep on her good side. Shortly after getting the cards, Chuck amazed the waitresses at his grandmother's restaurant with his readings. Patrons were asking for him, and strangers soon came in looking for him. His uncle gave him a little cash box, and on some days the five-year-old had as much in it as his grandmother had in the cafe's cash register. Those receiving readings had spontaneously and gratefully made donations to him. He was popular with both African Americans and white Kansas City residents. So impressed was a minister from a nearby Missouri town that he convinced Chuck's grandmother to allow the boy to prophesy from his church's pulpit. Chuck became a minister at six years old and was licensed at seven. An ordained minister in the Holiness Church at twelve years old, he toured the South with a sponsoring minister accompanied by his grandmother often the principal speaker in the tents and small churches where they held service, the child read the tarot cards from the pulpit, frequently drawing large crowds. 
A lot of kids used to come to me for advice. I just told them, and it was always right. It was such a natural thing. It was no big deal, recollects Vera Sutton about her psychic counseling as a student in junior high and high school. They would say, I have this problem and that problem, and I would go from there. They knew it worked, so they came back. Other than that, I was real quiet about my gift. I stayed to myself. Vera was struck by the magnitude of her popularity as a counselor while in the ninth grade. I thought, why are they all coming to me about their boyfriends and problems? You sound like our mothers, she was told. I remember one girl saying that I always looked and acted more mature. The youngest of ten children, Vera was born in Atlanta. She relates that she was raised in a very loving home environment by both parents. The young girl preferred being alone at home and at school. Shyness did not cause her to withdraw. She did so as a matter of choice, catering to an impelling need to meditate and explore her inner self. I was always within myself for whatever. I remember praying since I was three. When I was nine, my sister gave me my own personal Bible. I read it until the back came off. I used to sit and meditate and be right in those places where Jesus Christ was, holding his hand and going around with him when he talked to people. I could see myself doing that. In describing her childhood gift, Vera relates, I remember being aware when I was very young even as early as five years old, of a natural knowing. It wasn't like a voice. I never heard anything. I didn't close my eyes. It was just something that was part of my consciousness, and I was so clear about it. It was not like reading faces or anything like that. It was self-knowing. I knew that I knew, and what I came up with was right. There was no struggle to it. It was natural and clear and without a big ado. Pleased that he could elevate his body and his books into the air without any physical means, eight-year-old James often allowed himself that pleasure. I would actually be suspended from the bed. His spirit guide warning, you are misusing your gift eventually taught the boy how to convert the energy he was using for amusement back into his body to be used for something more practical, such as healing. I had a spirit that was charged to me when I was a child. The spirit looked like an Arabian man. The little man told me that his brother was going to come, and when he would come, there would always be trouble, very deep trouble, explains James Moyer who was seven when the spirit mentor entered his life. James was 14 when the being did arrive with another spirit, his twin brother. They had come to console and support him, but he was not aware why. It was soon after that James' mother died. I was somewhere between six and seven that I remember seeing these people come from the cemetery. They would come and talk to me, these people would come like floating apparitions. They would appear to be on floats. I would always see the mist rising up. They would be talking at one time. I told my mother that I saw these people coming, and they had to be dead, because they were all so pale. I was born with a gift. I was able to see so much at an early age. There was a telepathic tie with his mother, and the ability to see future events followed. At first, he only shared his prophetic insights with family members, but by the time he was nine, he was making predictions at church. His message-giving was frowned upon by the church hierarchy, and there was official effort made to suppress James' activities. I chose to go underground, more or less. People would still want to know. They would ask me after service if I saw anything for them. One woman, told by her doctor that she would never bear a child, asked then nine-year-old James to pray for her. I prayed for her, and the child did come.